Welcome back to Marbella Now. My name is Nicole King and once again I'm welcoming my guest here to the Palacio de Congresos, the exhibition centre in the heart of Marbella. Makes me laugh sometimes because so many people drive past this every day and have no idea it exists. But it does and they have a lot of great events going on. You can organise events here and it's also like a hub for the resident community. So do check out what's going on in the Palacio de Congresos. But right now we're going to meet my first guest of today and that is -da, Rachel <laughs> Garrett, Dr. Rachel Garrett, I should say. <laughs> Doctor, Doctor, hello. Doctor. Hello, <laughs> hi. Good to see you again. It's really nice to yeah. see you, and it's nice to see you out and about because as of yesterday, <laughs> you are COVID free. COVID free, yes. How um, was it? What happened? What, well, how did you find out? Tell me the whole process, if okay, you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. A bunch of we, my husband and I, because my husband's older than me, he's 70 odd, we decided to avoid the New Year's festivities and be sensible and go home. But on New Year's Day, we had a, a lunch with eight other friends in their house. And unfortunately, one of those friends had been feeling a little bit unwell, but didn't know that he had COVID. And after that, six, I think, six of the eight, we all came down with it. So we all immediately went and got tested. He found out that he had it because somebody at work had got tested and found out they had it. So he immediately went and got tested. He told all of us immediately. We then all self-isolated and most of us felt it was worthwhile getting a test just to know one way or another. So we went and got a test. Um, I Where did you go, if I can ask yeah, you? Yeah, so I booked a private test at Clinico del Rio, but I believe you can do it on the, we also have the health, the salute here. Um, it's just, to be honest, it was just easier to book the private test. So I've actually seen they've got COVID testing here in the exhibition They center. have indeed. Yes. <laughs> and, um, so we had the, I had the test, uh, I was positive. But my husband, weirdly, had the test as well, and he wasn't positive. So then we had that awkward situation where we had to self-isolate in the house. So I moved to the upstairs bedroom, he moved downstairs, and um, then we were advised that he'd get another test in a few days in case it had been a false negative. And four days later, he got tested, and then he was positive. So then I, he was allowed back in the bed. Oh, I was allowed back in the bed. <laughs> he was allowed back upstairs. And the, the one who suffered the most was definitely the dog because when it was just me up in the bedroom, it was me and the dog, and he's not supposed to sleep on the bed. So when the husband came back, the dog was off the bed again, so. Yeah, quite unfair. <laughs> yeah, poor. A lot of people are using the dogs actually during <laughs> these times. I know when I was at AAA last week, and they are now doing like home visits and things to, for dog adoptions, when they really want dogs to go, but the, so many people were taking the dog so they could walk the dog Do in the lockdown, walking. and once they went back to work, they were just dropping it back off again. Oh. You know that? Ali, you can't do that. No, that's I mean, not so right. No. Our dogs do seem to suffer all out yeah. of little whims and wants. I know. So, so you, anyway. You know, they're doing the, some dogs, are, they're, they're training dogs to do COVID testing. They how does, how does that come they about? They can sniff it. They can sniff uh, chemical changes in your body. Oh, wow. How cool I is know. that? How yeah. cool is that? That's a nice way of doing it's much it. Much nicer. Than pet a dog and it just say yes or no. Like yeah, a, much nicer than having the swab. Exactly. Um, so is that what happens? They just do a swab and then yes, how long so does it take for the result? I had a nasal swab. I, there's two types of testing that you can do. or well, three types actually. But the two types to test whether you presently have COVID or not are an antigen test. So they're looking for the proteins of the COVID. And they basically put um, like a cotton wool bod very high up your nose. And the other one is a PCR, which is a blood test. And that's, a, that's looking more for the genetic material. The PCR will take two to three days for the results to come through. And it's probably more accurate. Right, that's what I was going to say. If there's so yeah. many options, how do we know which? Or do you have to do all of them? Or? Well, I think for most people, the antigen test is sufficient. And the antigen test is the results come back within 15 minutes. So that's nice and easy because you can go to the clinic, you wait for your results, and then you know one way or another whether you've got to self-isolate or not. The PCR, as I said, I think is probably is more accurate, and many workplaces insist on a PCR before you come back. Um, and as I say, the PCR is still picking up bits of genetic material. But you can also be tested to see whether you have the antibodies of COVID. Which means you had it. Exactly. It means right. So hopefully now, 
I should be in a relatively nice position of having the antibodies in my body, which at the moment, the most recent research is suggesting that I should be immune from COVID now for six months, hopefully. I mean, I still want the vaccine as soon as it comes, as soon as that's available, but it's not going to be available for me too soon. So, In your work, you obviously... Um you specialise in breathing yeah. and rehabilitation of breathing yeah. and everything to do with the breathing. lungs and breathing. And as I understand it, particularly from a few posts I've read lately, I mean, just Alison Cuddy the other day put a post in, in the, the, the panic and the fear, yeah. the, the lack of breath, the, yeah. the, the, this unfamiliar feeling, this, this fear yeah. of not being able to catch a breath. Can you explain a bit what's going on? Well, I think it's important to say, first of all, that for most people who get COVID, they will have relatively mild symptoms. Uh, they might feel tired. They might have a bit of coldy symptoms. Right, we were talking about you and how... Yeah, well, exactly. You. Our symptoms... I did feel tired. I didn't feel terribly well, but I didn't feel terribly ill either. I never felt terribly ill. Um, we had friends who also called it from that event, one who would be at high risk because of his size. And actually, he did pretty well with it as well. I and, mean, you know, we were all quite worried about him because... He was at high risk. My husband, who's 72, just sort of sailed through it in his normal manner, just drank his normal wine. So we weren't too badly affected, but there's certainly, you know, I knew when I was better. It, it's also, the fatigue has gone. I feel back to myself again. Um, I didn't have a cough, quite common not to have a cough, but also I didn't have any changes in smell or taste. My husband did get a cough, but he often gets a cough if he has this sort of an asthma cough, if he has, um, a cold or something so we didn't get a fever some other friends had fever for a long time two weeks and that was horrible dealing with that fever i mean if you've got fever the first, it's your body's way of responding to the virus and maybe if you're feverish for five six days then that's actually just okay just sort of manage it but really if you're feverish for a longer time then the recommendation is you should be using something like paracetamol, prob probably paracetamol, but Bufin as well, to get that fever down, because in fact the fever, a long-term fever, might do other harm to the body. Uh -huh. um, but it's really important, honest to goodness, everybody watching this, most of you, if you get it, will be fine. And I know people with underlying respiratory disease are really, really, really worried about getting it, and that's also very valid. But a lot, you know, it's very random. There's, how severe you get it, um, how you get it, it, it's, it's, who gets it, it's very random. And who is going to be really ill with it is very, very, very hard to tell. We know that obesity and diabetes are real big risk factors for being bad with it. What does but, COVID actually attack? Is it the immune system? Because a lot of people are talking about immune system, boosting the immune system now. But I suppose that's just a general getting yourself in a better place yeah. if anything yeah. happens. Well, your immune system is just what fights off the virus. So, so it's a virus. It's got these little spike proteins that we keep seeing on TV. And these spike proteins will attach to different cells in the body. And why COVID gives so many varied symptoms is that they might be attaching in the brain, which might explain some of the... Covid fog, they're calling it, the, the, the tiredness, the fatigue and the sort of uh, demotivation. But it obviously it attaches to receptors and to cells in the lungs, which is why you can get the lung disease with it and the cough. And you can get severe pneumonia and hypoxia. And I think we should... What's hypoxia? Yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> I know I'm terrible. So ignorant. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm, I'm not oh, I do like terms. to ask when I don't know. No, it's, it's like... good because we should speak in lay terms because then people understand. So hypoxia is when your oxygen levels are dangerously low or low. Uh, with COVID, if it does attach into the lungs, it can make you hypoxic. One of the horrible things about COVID is it can make you, normally if your oxygen levels go low, then you will start breathing faster and you will feel this breathlessness that you're talking about. You will feel out of breath and you know, know that you've got low oxygen level. Unfortunately, COVID can actually, in some cases, fight that in a weird way they don't quite understand why although there's some theories where you get hypoxic but you don't actually feel unwell so you're still chatting you're still feeling okay even though your oxygen levels although you're breathless you don't well, actually feel ill well yeah. no you're not breathless no this is the really oh. weird thing about covid uh there's something called happy hypoxia in covid and it's it's unusual i mean it can be explained and i, I do understand but it's quite complicated why they might have it 
But happy hypoxia is people turning up at A&E or people being seen by the doctor and the doctor finds out that their oxygen levels are dangerously low. But in fact, they weren't even breathless. They were still chatting away like normal, eating like normal. They had no symptoms of breathlessness. That's why I think, right, with COVID, it is important to get yourself, and you can buy them from the chemist. Um, it's called a pulse oximeter, a saturation monitor. I think I've talked about these before because I use these with all my patients because my patients are often hypoxic. Um, so what this does, you need to have warm hands. If you've got cold hands and bad circulation, it gives you a really bad result and everybody starts to panic. But let's see if my hands are warm enough. <laughs> it's just this little monitor, it goes on your finger and it gives you a reading of both your heart rate and the saturation rate. And the saturation is how much of your red blood cells are saturated with oxygen. I'm not getting a reading. That's what I mean, they can be a bit reliable. My hands are a wee bit cold. I'll try and warm my hands. Oh, here we go. That's better. Right. I still don't think that. They can be reliable and they can be giving sort of danger, you know, odd readings. At the moment, this is not picking up properly because my hands, hands are, are cold. cold. And I know it's not picking up properly because it's telling me my heart rate is 80. And I can feel my heart rate. It's nowhere near 80. What should the heart rate be? Well, if you're a fit person, a resting heart rate might be only 60 beats a minute. And the normal heart rate would be 70 to 80 beats a, me a minute. But then, of course, if you do any exercise or move around, or you know, your heart rate will mm. go up considerably. And, of course, that's good because it needs to. Uh, here we go. I'm better now. Right. So my oxygen level now is 99%. Which obviously is very good. Which is very good. In fact, that's probably not true because really the maximum you can get for saturation of your oxygen level is 98. So a good saturation is 98%. 96 to 98 is absolutely fine. 94, if you've got underlying respiratory disease, is, is fairly normal. If it starts to go below 92 or below 90, 92 to below 90, you do need to get some other help because that's when... But like I keep saying, most people will not have a problem with their lungs. Most people will feel cough, might feel a bit tight in the chest, um, might feel a, a bit uncomfortable and coughing a lot but they won't actually have problems with the oxygen. It's unusual to have problems with the oxygen. If someone does and they feel, or you've gone round, because I know that you have been to several people's homes, yeah. which is wonderful, and that is a very big thing. Take so if you're not feeling good, Dr. Rachel will come and see you, but you have been to mutual friends and you've gone and tested their oxygen levels. Yeah. I don't know how it went, but let's say, not in that case, but in any case, yeah. it's not, optimum what would you do what should be done when your oxygen levels are you need to worryingly phone, low you need to phone the doctors that's when you need to go to the hospital yeah. or yeah. you need to get oxygen yeah. or something you need to get oxygen and you know, you can be, i mean you can manage covid at home 98 percent of the time 98.4 percent of the time you will manage covid at home and you'll just feel a bit fluey you just feel a bit under the weather you may have a fever you know as i said but you won't need oxygen you only need, really, the real sign for going to hospital is going to be if the fever persists and persists and moves into delirium or confusion, then obviously you need to call somebody. Um, and if your oxygen levels are very low, so that's when you need to get, get help from the, from the hospital because you will need something called high flow, you probably need something called high flow oxygen therapy and that can't be administered at home. When my son was a baby, he had bronchiolitis oh, yeah. from birth till five years old. And we were always giving him inhalers, yeah. um, Ventolin, all kinds of things like that. Are these um, like helpful in this instance? Not really, not really, because it's predominantly um, an, uh, sort of an airway disease that is not receptive to those kind of treatments. If it's very, very, very severe, very, very, very severe, it is receptive to um, a steroid treatment but you don't want to be giving a steroid treatment in the early days because the steroid treatment dampens down your own body's immune response and that's not what you want to be happening. What your son was getting was, was bronchodilators and these are things that open up the airways because the airways have gone into spasm and it's common with asthma, COPD that I treat and bronchiolitis, so they get a lot of flow. It was like the little um, ventricles that go from the lungs into the blood, those little tiny endings. It was those that yeah, were like really, yes, inflamed, that's. yes. Yeah, inflammation of the air sacs. I only yeah. know it in Spanish. It happened in Spain. <laughs> Spanish <laughs> doctors. I, only, I can only talk to you about that time of my life in Spanish. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's the alveoli, it's the little air sacs. They get inflamed. 
Did he have a lot of phlegm or not? Yeah, he was always yeah. very poorly. Yeah. It was very worrying until he was oh, five. And the doctor said, by the time he's five, it'll be over. And he did actually. Wow. Just make a change. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to have to go to a break right now, but do not go away. We're talking about got COVID. Now what? With Dr. Rachel Garrett. Don't go away. We'll be back in a moment. John's car is still being repaired, so he's delighted that Judy has come to pick him up. However, after a very heavy business trip, he's less than enthusiastic when her car breaks down. I had sure with Linia Director. She tells John. So please do relax, I've got this. And she had. The taxi was there in no time. Her car safely towed for repairs, and a courtesy car readily available. Call Linear Director on 952-1478-34 to see how they can better your life too. When I'm the designated driver, I think it's only fair that I get to choose a Zero Hero venue that rewards me with free soft drinks. My friends all get to choose and booze and they feel safe going home with me. Make sure that you get your reward for being the designated driver. Why pay if you don't have to? Hi guys, Ross here from Hogan Stand. Proud to be a member of the Zero Hero campaign. And uh, we recommend everybody. Nobody drives drinking. Everybody who drives a car doesn't have any alcohol in their system. And we're proud to sponsor the Zero Hero program. GYN is happy to be zero zero partner. How cool is that? <laughs> GYN. Thank you. That's okay. I'm proud to present Zero to Hero. Never drink and drive. Yes, I mean, do you think that's. Mike Moses is proud to be a zero hero partner. Out of bounds, zero hero partners. Here we are, sticker going on, delighted to welcome everybody and to be part of the Zero Hero campaign. Delighted. If you've just tuned in, I'm chatting with Dr. Rachel Garrett, and the subject has been tested positive for COVID, and now what? We're going to come back now to talk about lung exercises, but also our frame of mind playing yeah. such an important role on everything. Yeah, yeah. And our yeah. health being one of those important yeah. issues. Uh, yeah, I mean, anxiety that we get, you can, I, so as I said, I'm a respiratory physiotherapist with a PhD in looking after people with heart and lung problems. So what I do is I go and visit people with heart and lung problems at home and I help them breathe more easily, do more exercise, um, learn about their condition and manage the anxiety. So that's what we're really talking about because there is so much anxiety now, it, it, regardless of whether, you've got, whether you're ill or not, the whole situation is stressful. I mean, it's stressful because if you're somebody who normally likes to plan, then you, you can't plan, you can't make any decisions and work money and stress, uh, money stresses. I mean, it, it is a really, really tough time. There are, some, there are some simple tips and hacks that you can do to help manage anxiety. In fact, on, um, just big myself up here, because you, you letting me. <laughs> but on Saturday- I wouldn't I, invite you otherwise. <laughs> yeah, on Saturday I gave five hours of lecturing to the Irish Respiratory Physiotherapy Society. Online lecturing, 80 people turned up to watch. Oh, well done you. I know, it was really nerve wracking and it went really well. And one of the talks that I gave was about what can physiotherapists do to help manage anxiety? I don't know, have you heard of box breathing? No. Right, okay, box breathing is recommended by uh, Navy SEALs. It's got, yeah, I know, very, a very handsome one as well. By <laughs> <laughs> and it's got lots of good effects on uh, focus, on stress, it reduces stress, it, reduce, it enables you to focus more effectively. 
and it calms heart rate and it calms respiratory rate. So box breathing, should we do it together? It's okay. It's so simple. Right, so it's basically what we're going to do is we're going to breathe in through the nose for the count of four, then we're going to hold it for four, and then we're going to exhale for four through the nose. So keep the shoulders relaxed. It's not about taking a massive deep breath, it's just breathing in for four. And as you do that instant calm, instant calm, as you do that exhalation, you feel everything. They, they say it's like the stress bleeds out. So that box breathing, breathe in for four through the nose, hold it for four, breathe out through the nose for four. Is really, really simple. And you do it two or three times, four times when you're feeling anxious. And it just lets it all go, doesn't it? I think sometimes we don't realise we're anxious. Yeah. And I think half the battle, like anything, is knowing what's going on. We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. But I think since I've started meditating, even yeah. if it's just yeah. trying to keep my mind calm, listen yeah. to my breathing. But what I have noticed is maybe I do sometimes still get anxious and worked up, but I have a tendency to catch it now. Good. That's and once brilliant. you can catch it, you can like bring yourself down again because I'm an enthusiastic yeah. person and you can get carried away with people's problems because Echo, the Butterfly Children, this charity, yeah. they're closing the British cemetery for lack of funds and yeah. in the end, you know I mean, it can be overwhelming with everyone yeah. having such a tough time right now, even if it's not your own personal yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you're an empathetic person like you, very much so. I think when what happens when you start to get anxious and you start to get stresses is fascinating because you're a million percent right that you can be anxious before you even know that you're anxious. And actually there's a part in the brain called the amygdala, uh, just about somewhere around there, anyway, in the brain somewhere, there's two of them, and they react to stressors before your consciousness knows of it. So before you're aware you are of what you're anxious about, you're actually anxious. That's why managing anxiety can be so different and difficult, and that is why learning to spot the signs, so the signs might be raised heart rate, they might be sort of sicky feeling in the stomach, you might find that your shoulders have gone up, your breathing becomes a bit erratic, so instead of breathing nice and slowly, you're now taking, you're breathing more apically. One of the things that physios do a lot of work on is teaching people to use the diaphragm when they're breathing, and that's useful if you've got COVID as well, because you need to get those air sacs all inflated at the bottom of the lungs, and you can only do that if you really effectively use the diaphragm, which is this big muscle here. You do use the diaphragm all the time, but sometimes in anxiety and stress, it's like this, you're breathing, you're breathing all up here. If you see somebody, if you catch your breathing and it's up here, that's a sign that you're anxious and stressed and you need to get those shoulders down. We do some tummy breathing, if you like. It's called tummy breathing. You okay. So this is like a, this is diaphragmatic breathing, tummy breathing, and it's, it's designed to help open up the airways it's also calming and it's part of a treatment to help clear airway secretions. It's a sort of the first step. So what you're kind of doing, well, just the tummy breathing is part of the treatment to clear secretions. Uh, one hand here, one hand here. The aim is to have this hand move just gently out as you breathe in. Breathe in through the nose and out and in this case you might want to sigh out because it's quite nice and relaxing to just take a sigh out what you're noticing or what you're trying to be aware of is that you're not breathing like this some people say take a big deep breath in and as soon as you say take a big deep breath in they go well actually that hasn't got the air to the bottom of the lungs at all all that's done is make this area full of air and also make you dry here not very nice. So, relaxed, controlled, diaphragmatic breathing is the, the tummy slowly comes out as you breathe in. This is less movement here. And as you sigh out, the tummy comes back down. And the reason the tummy comes out is because the diaphragm, which is this muscle here, has moved down and flattened to open up the lungs and let them get all the air in and that pushes on the tummy 
people sometimes sort of force when they do this technique they go and they're not that's not using the air to get the breathing right that's just pushing the tummy out so it isn't about pushing the tummy out it's about breathe in that wasn't so good actually shoulders down okay <laughs> there's a technique obviously so if you don't get it the first time it really is just work on it because yeah. the more oxygen in our bodies the healthier we will be that is yeah. the, basically it's our most important substance that goes in our body with <laughs> water pretty essential yeah, yeah water yeah. brings oxygen in as well it's yeah like it's coming from everywhere when people get anxious they sometimes hyperventilate which means they over breathe um people can also have this chronic i tend to hold my breath ah there you go Yep, I was going to say sighing. I just stop breathing. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's brilliant. That's a really good one. Sighing and um, breath holding are signs of hyperventilation because actually what you're doing is you breath hold and then when you next need to breathe, you've got low oxygen levels. So you start breathing like that, which is then too much breath mm -hmm. for what the body needs. So I used to breath hold. I used to be nervous, very nervous of driving in Spain and, I, and particularly tunnels. I don't know why tunnels, but tunnels were my thing. And I'd always go through the tunnel and I'd be breath holding and my shoulders were scrunched and I was like this and then when I came out of the tunnel I'd be like <gasps> and then I would have a panic be more panicky because then I had lowered the levels of carbon dioxide which makes you feel jittery and anxious and heart ratey mm -hmm. so now like you I know my trigger I see the tunnel I think right consciously I think shoulders down diaphragmatic breathing Breathe nice and steady through the tunnel and lo and behold, I'm not anxious going through the tunnel anymore. It's like anything, awareness is yeah. key and then once there is something, it's addressing the issue as opposed to ignoring it or let yeah. it just go with it. It's yeah, like, I you do, okay, I know this is a key for me, I'm going to yeah. do something yeah. to overcome it. So yeah. breathing exercises when we're getting anxious about our health because yeah. that can obviously trigger yeah. worse health i mean i have to say yeah, i does. feel yeah, healthier does. now than i did when we started the interview just because everything you're saying is so reassuring you understand what's going on it makes sense so really there's not so much need to panic there's only yeah. a few cases yeah, that will very react few. adversely yeah. within the yeah. big scale of very things. few yeah and i think you know chronic anxiety i mean we know that people with underlying lung conditions uh, about 25% of people with asthma also have hyperventilation on top of the asthma, which then will make the asthma worse. COPD people have 50% have chronic hyperventilation on top of the COPD. It's a circle. So, and people have live with this condition with chronic hyperventilation can do for a long time. And, then, and it's mistaken often for heart disease, which makes you more anxious. It's funny, actually, because I heard recently as well, dehydration can give yeah. symptoms of mental illness and okay. all kinds of things that really aren't the case. They're just dehydrated, yeah. particularly elderly people, which you do deal with. In fact, Rachel is in charge of training volunteers for AAA, our age, con uh, AAA, age concern, our elderly association. But we do have to leave it yeah. there for today. But very yeah. interesting very useful i'm going home to practice all my breathing exercises <laughs> there's loads there's loads i could do right and if you have any doubts please do contact rachel should be delighted to speak to yeah. you or pay you a visit and give you some personal support yeah absolutely and i also provide online support now which is working really well especially with the anxiety funnily enough i've been really impressed i do hypnotherapy now and you can hypnotize somebody online <laughs> How cool is that? Yes, can you so unhypnotize cool. yes, them you as can. well? Yes, you can. Yes, okay. You can. <laughs> Important just to add that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it is cool. Well, yeah. next time we'll talk about okay, that. Okay, yeah, Fascinating. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us to find out more about what's going on in Marbella now. I hope you enjoyed meeting my guests and that you will join us again tomorrow. Tune in to RTV Marbella. You can also watch via streaming and you can get links to the catch-up shows from my website nicoleking.es Take care of yourselves, be nice to each other and I'll see you again tomorrow. Hasta mañana.